Today's subject is the idea of novelty, the idea of living life where things are new and exciting and full of zest and passion and robust enjoyment. How do we get that our experiences and our interactions and our relationships are full with a sense of novelty and how do we maintain it in every area of our lives? I think one area that this is particularly relevant is in relationships and especially the most important relationship interpersonal relationship that we have in our lives with our spouses. There is a bevy of studies that talk about declines in marriages and in relationships, and specifically in the most intimate parts of marriage. And it's really sad because a lot of couples are very dedicated to each other and really love each other, but something happens to that relationship. It erodes over time And there is a myriad of studies that talk about specifically in the most intimate parts of the relationship, uh, over time there's a decline, a precipitous decline in frequency, intensity, and satisfaction of the most intimate interactions between husband and wife. And I think it would be very valuable if we could find a, a method to stave off the decline and erosion in our relationships and find a way to keep things exciting. Of course, this is important in the physical sense, and we'll see it's important on the spiritual sense too. Now, the way we are wired is that yesterday's news doesn't excite us. No one gets excited over yesterday's sizzling steak, something that may may have been very appealing and very alluring when it was fresh and novel, doesn't titulate us anymore. And there's an amazing Ramban in this week's Parsha, uh, chapter 29, verse 18. And Moshe is telling the Jewish people at the end of his life that there may be individuals or entities amongst the nation that are sinful and think that they could do whatever they want and they won't have to face any consequences. And then the verse ends with a cryptic line, Leman Sephos Harava Esatsmeya, which means in order to increase the those that are satiated with thirst. So it's not clear what this what this means exactly. And the Ramban has a very famous, very powerful teaching regarding the nature of pursuing and imbibing in lust. And he says that when, 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 the, when the person is satiated, when they're calm, when they don't feel needs, that's called rava. That means that they're satiated. And when they're desirous, they're called smeya. They're thirsty. They're, they're hungry. And he says something which is counterintuitive, but we see in, our, in, in, in reality that it's actually true. He says that the way lust actually operates is not quite the way you would expect. Typically, when someone has a need and they address the need, then the need is quelled, it's quieted, it's satiated. You're done, you're good. However, in matters of physical lust, it's the opposite. The more you desire it and the more you capitulate to the desires, the more graphic and depraved, uh, uh, the more graphic and the more degenerate those needs become. And essentially, you try to quench the thirst of lust, but ironically, you just increase the thirst. And he gives a striking example that you may have someone who is lustful after women, but over time, that loses its appeal. And what excited him and what his desires were in the past, they no longer excite him anymore and he has to go down this this spiral uh, of depravity seeking more and more devious pleasures in order to just reach the equilibrium. And he describes a situation where you'll have someone who is not naturally physiologically attracted uh, to um, to the same sex and certainly not to um, other really 
depraved forms of sexual pleasure, such as bestiality, but because they just give in again and again, and they try to fulfill all these assumed needs, they actually start desiring things that are totally unnatural and not what they would have desired previously. And the idea being is that we desire novelty, but we don't seem to get it in the physical realm. And the Talmud tells us in this particular area that several places in the Talmud, that there is a small organ in man that does not operate the way you would expect. Masbio ra'ev, if you satiate it, it's hungry. Marivo, but if you starve it, saveya, then it is sate. Ironically, the less you feed it, the less the hunger is. And we are wired to try to feed a need or what we assume is a need and we don't actually get the payoff because the need just goes further and further down the road to all levels of degeneracy, depravity, debauchery, and deviousness. Just this past week or week two weeks ago, there was a uh, there was a, an annual gathering of sorts in a desert in Nevada called Burning Man. And if you want to see the idea of the Ramban in action, that's actually found in in Burning Man, where you have all these people who get together and they're pursuing with absolute futility the uh, drive for novelty. And when they try to get it, it seems to go further and further out of their grasp, compelling them to act in ways that are very uh, devious. So, well, how do we undo it? So this is the negative side where people try to get novelty and don't get it. Is there a way to retain the spark and to keep things fresh and to keep the passion and keep the joy and excitement and the newness of our relationships? What what can the Torah tell us about this? And I think that's just a one pursuit. But I think as Jews who are influenced by Torah, we have a very similar problem on a spiritual side. We pray many times a day, three times a day, and four times in Shabbos and five and, and holidays, and five times in Yom Kippur. And you look at the prayer for the morning prayer, and the prayer for the afternoon prayer, and the evening prayer, and they're actually remarkably similar. So a thousand times a year, we're saying the exact same prayer. And how do we maintain the excitement And how do we not fall into a path of habit and acting out of rote in our spiritual activities? Every morning on a weekday, you put on tefillin. And it's the same tefillin. You've had them since your bar mitzvah. And you put them on the exact same way. And that's a mitzvah. But is it a mitzvah replete with meaning? Maybe it was initially, but over time... The tendency is that you get accustomed. It becomes a thing you do. It's a habit. We become Jews by habit. We're doing religion by habit. And that's a grave problem. Because the Talmud tells us, based upon a verse in Isaiah chapter 29, that there's something called mitzvahs anashim milumada, doing mitzvahs out of habit. And the Talmud says something very surprising. The punishment for doing mitzvahs out of habit is worse than the punishment of idolatry. If you do a mitzvah based upon, uh, it, it's just monotonous. You're, you're like a robot, just acting the way you've acted yesterday and previous. There's no life to it. That's actually a worse sin than idolatry, which is pretty scary because, like we said, we're doing the identical prayers, identical, identical mitzvahs. It's the same thing. And how do we stave off monotony? How we? It's only natural for us to get accustomed to it. I remember the day uh, that I first put on tefillin, so the custom is to wear tefillin for a month to practice before the bar mitzvah. Of course, a, a Jewish boy is only obligated to wear tefillin once they are an adult, but the tradition is to practice several times for like a month before the bar mitzvah to be ready. And I remember the day that I put on tefillin, and I was in eighth grade in uh, in school, elementary school, 
And one of the rabbis, he's like, oh, you put on tefillin today. You must have been very excited. And indeed I was. It was so excited. You get to put on tefillin. You feel so special. You feel like an adult. You're doing a mitzvah. This is so amazing. So he tells me, you should be as excited every day of your life that you put on tefillin as you are today. And that sounds nice, but in reality, how do you do that? And especially given the fact that the consequences of not doing it, the consequences of doing mitzvos out of habit are very grave. So in all these areas of our life, the question that I want to address is how do we have novelty in our life? So I want to quote three verses in Deuteronomy and Devarim and three accompanying Rashi's. One of the verses is a very famous verse it's in the Shema. It's in chapter 6 of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 6. Read it in Hebrew. V'hayu hadvarim ha'ele asher anochim etzavcha hayom alevavecha. And it shall be, the, these matters that I command you today shall be on your heart. So this is, of course, a very famous verse that the, the words that the Almighty commands us today should be on our heart. So Rashi asks the question, what does the word today mean? The, 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 the mitzvot that I command you today. Rashi says, don't make the mitzvot like an ancient decree. Rather, it should be new and fresh. It shouldn't be stale and old, like it was given to you a million years ago or a thousand years ago. Rather, it should be something brand new, That everyone is running to, it should be the new fad. It should be the new, what's exciting, what should be, what's really stimulating. That's what mitzvahs should be. That's Rashi number one, where we're told in the Shema that mitzvahs should be really exciting. Okay, I'll put that aside. Chapter 26, verse 16. I'll read it in Hebrew. Hayom hazeh Hashem alokechem et savcha lasos sakutim ha'elev et smashutim v'shmart vasiz ha'osam b'chol v'avchov chol navshecha. Again, on this day, Hashem your God commands you to do the edicts and the laws, and you should guard them and perform them with all your heart, with all your soul. Again, we see the word on this day. And again, Rashi says, what does this mean? What is the inference on this day? Bechol yom, on every day, each and every day, in 2017, where 3,000 years, 3,300 years after Sinai, we should still do today, every day it should be considered as if today we were commanded, as if today we're at the foot of the mountain of Mount Sinai, we're getting mitzvahs from God, they're brand new, they're fresh, we're so excited to rip open the package, we have that joy and that zeal and that zest to to perform the mitzvahs, that same excitement, we have to try to have it today. Of course, this seems really difficult to do. And thirdly, we're told, again, in last week's parasha, this is uh, chapter 27, verse 9. Vayemer Moshe, al Yisrael, Moshe, and the Kohanim tell the Jewish people, Haskes ushma Yisrael, hearken and hear, O Israel, hayom hazen hiyesalam, on this day you became a nation. Says Rashi a third time, every single day a person should, should consider it, it should be in their eyes as if on that day, they came into a relationship with God. Even though we've been a nation for 3,000 years, and we've had a relationship with God for 3,000 years, still, it's important and imperative, it's a mitzvah for us to consider as if today was the first day, today's the first day I became a Jew, uh, and actually have the same degree of excitement um, as a result. So what's interesting here is that according to the Torah, according to Rashi, it is possible, moreover, it's required to have novelty in mitzvos, novelty in our covenant with God, novelty in the Shema. It's possible and it's required. But Rashi does not tell us how to do it. We must, every time you do a mitzvah, you should feel like it's brand new. We're at Sinai, this is the first time I was told about it, amazing, I'm so excited. And that's a requirement from the Torah but we're not told specifically how to do it. And I think, moreover, just broadly speaking, there seems to be a very famous verse or refrain from 
Kohelet from the book of Ecclesiastes that seems to imply that novelty is inaccessible. Famously, we're told in Ecclesiastes, according to Jewish tradition, written by, by Shlomo HaMelech, by King Solomon, Ein kol chadash tachas hashamesh. There is nothing new under the sun. Everything's old. Everything's stale. And yet, we're told in the Torah, no, mitzvahs are new, and you have to make them new. And every day is supposed to be as if you were at Sinai. Every day is the first day you're a Jewish person. Every mitzvah is as if today you were commanded in it. So the question is, how is it possible to do it? How could it be required? What's the meaning behind it? And how does it not conflict with the refrain from Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun? So I want to introduce a Talmud. The Talmud in the book of Brachos on page 63b reads as follows. Pasach Rabbi Yehuda B'Kvod Torah. Rabbi Yehuda was giving a lecture and he opened his lecture honoring Torah. And he quotes, again, the verse in Deuteronomy 27.9, the one we just read. Hasgez Ushma Yisrael, hearken and listen, O Israel. Hayom hazeh nehiyesa la'am. On this day, you became a nation. And he asked the obvious question. If you understand the story, where we are in history, this is at the end of Moshe's life. And this is at the end of the 40 years that the Jewish people have spent in the wilderness since they left Egypt. So ask the Talmud, V'chi'osa hayom nitna Torah li Yisrael. Was that the day that the Torah was given to the Jewish people? Is that the day that they were formed as a nation? V'halo oso yom sof arbaim shanahaya. Why, that day was at the end of the 40 years. Ella, rather, What's the verse? What does the verse mean? Hayom hazeh on this day you became a nation. Lelam dechad to teach you. Shechaviva Torah alom deha bechol yom vayom. That the Torah is beloved on those who learn it every single day. Kiyom shednitna mehar Sinai, as the day it was given from Sinai. When the verse talks about on this day you became a nation. That means, of course, it's not on this day became a nation, but it's possible that on every day, any, any, any time you read this verse, it's possible for you to have the same experience of Sinai. Why? Because the Torah is beloved on those who study it every day as if the day was given at Sinai. And the Talmud continues in a very, you read it simply, it seems like it's, it's a very, uh, the connection is not immediately evident, and Rabbi Tanchum, the son of Rabbi Chia, he adds, well, if someone reads the Shema in the morning and the evening every day, and one evening he doesn't read it, it's as if he never read Shema in his whole life. So we have the initial statement that those who study Torah every day, it's as beloved to them as the day was given at Sinai. And then we have this addendum that Oh, and I'll prove this to you, because if someone reads the Shema every day, morning and night, as we know, we're required to read the Shema twice a day, once in the morning, once at the night. So if someone reads the Shema twice a day, and one evening he doesn't read it, it's as if he never reads, he never read the Shema in his life. And obviously, we don't seem to see what is the connection between the first statement of the Talmud, that Torah is beloved on those who learn it every day, as if the day was given at Sinai, and the second about someone who reads Shema every day, but then forgets for one day, and it's as if he never read Shema in his life. What, what, are those, what do those things have to do with each other? Moreover, the second statement is very puzzling. If someone reads Shema every day of their life, and once they forget, it's as if they never read Shema in their life, that seems to be rather harsh. If someone reads the Shema, and if he misses one day, well, if only the Jewish people would have people that are so committed to prayer, and to Shema, that they only miss it once a day. I think that would be an improvement. Yet, the Talmud says that if someone misses a single day of Shema, even though he may have, he may have not missed a single day in his, his entire life, it's as if he never read Shema in his life. How do we make sense of such a harsh teaching? But I think, hold off on that second question. We'll answer it in a little bit. But I think the beginning of the Talmud, I think it demonstrates 
the Talmud's position of how to have novelty in Torah. I'll read it again. To teach you that the Torah is beloved on those who study it every single day as the, as, as the day it was given to us at Sinai. If there is continuous daily Torah study, that is the way to have novelty in Torah. Now, just to support this idea, there is a Midrash in the book of Rus, Ruth, regarding Acher. Acher uh, was one of the great tragedies of the Talmudic era because he was a great rabbi and a great scholar who indeed was the teacher of Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir is one of the greatest rabbis of the Mishnahic era. In fact, if you read a Mishnah, and the Mishnah is unattributed, you don't know who is the author of this teaching, the Talmud tells us, Stam Mishnah Rabbi Meir. If you have an unattributed Mishnah, then it's Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir, the architects of the Mishnah, took Rabbi Meir's teachings as the baseline for all of Mishnah. One of the greatest scholars, of course, is Rabbi Meir. Now, his teacher, he had many teachers, one of them, of course, being Rabbi Akiva, but one of his teachers, perhaps his primary teacher, was an individual by the name of Elisha ben Avuya. And he was one of the great rabbis and scholars of, uh, of his time. But he went astew, he went awry, and he abandoned Torah. And he was, in fact, the only rabbi of that era who went off, so to speak. And he dropped Torah and dropped observance. And it's, of course, a great tragedy if anyone drops Torah or drops observance, but someone who is at the absolute pinnacle of the Torah world, for him to do that uh, is doubly sad and tragic. And there's many teachings in the Talmud, primarily in Chadiga, about Acher, uh, how he actually got the name Acher, the nickname Acher, is in itself a story. When he decided to abandon Torah, he immediately went outside and began soliciting a prostitute. So you can imagine someone who was previously one of the great rabbis, and he starts going on Shabbos uh, to start soliciting uh, women of ill repute. Of course, that's a dramatic drop, precipitous drop uh, in status immediately. And the Talmud tells how, uh, so he went over to this woman and began to solicit her, and she says to them, wait a minute, aren't you the great Rabbi Elisha ben Avuya, one of the great rabbis? And on Shabbos, he goes to the ground and plucks out a flower from the earth, which is a transgression of one of the Torah laws. So he's trying to show her, well, I'm not observant of Shabbos, I'm, I must be a different guy. And she says, oh, you must be Acher, you must be someone else. And that became his nickname. And for the rest of his life, uh, Rabbi Meir uh, would con- continue to study Torah from him, even though uh, some of his colleagues were not so keen on that. And he, the Talmud says that Rabbi Meir was able to, if you have a fruit that rolls over in the dirt, in the mud, in the schmutz, Rabbi Meir was able to clean off the dirt and enjoy the fruit. He was able to divest the Torah of, of Acher, of his teacher, from all the other nonsense and all the other sins of his teacher. And of course, there's uh, dramatic stories about when Acher died and how Rabbi Meir tried to f- fight that he would always repent. Many stories. But the Midrash tells us what happened by the bris, by the circumcision ceremony of Acher. And it tells that his father, Avuya, was one of the leaders of Jerusalem, and at this bris, at this celebration, all the great rabbis of Jerusalem were present, including the great Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yehoshua, who were the greatest rabbis at the time, and both would go on to be teachers of the famed Rabbi Akiva. So what was going on at this bris? So the Talmud describes brought down in the Talmud, brought down in the Midrash, that everyone was doing their thing. There were some people who were talking, schmoozing, some people were eating, some were drinking, some were frolicking. Everyone was doing their thing. 
And Rabbi Eliezer turns to Rabbi Yeshua and says, look, everyone's doing their thing. These are eating, these are drinking. Let us do our thing. So what's the thing of the great rabbis, Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yehoshua? Of course, to study, study Torah. And the Midrash describes how they started studying Torah. And they studied first the Torah, and then the Nevi'im, and then the Nitzuim. They, they started going through all of Talmud and all of, all of Torah. And immediately, a fire surrounded them. A spiritual fire surrounded them. And the words were Semechem Kinesinasa Messinai. The words were as joyous as the day it was given at Sinai. They were able to recapture the experience of Sinai. And just like by Sinai, the Torah was given with fire, so too when they studied, the Torah was given with fire. Again, we see an example of them actually fulfilling the, the dictum of the Talmud, that you should study Torah with the same excitement as if it was given. But it's also interesting to note, the Talmud gives the intro, that they said, let us do our thing. The Torah was not something that they uh, would do whenever it suited them. The Torah was their thing. They were committed to it. They engaged with it on a daily, ongoing basis. Someone like that, as the Talmud says, well, it's as joyous and as exciting as Sinai, and it was even manifest in having the same conditions present when they would study as were present at Sinai. And of course, the epilogue of the story is, is that Avuya, he sees this big fire and he doesn't know what it is. He goes over to the rabbis, are you trying to burn down my house? And they say to him, no, we're just trying to study Torah. Well, how do you have this fire? And they explain to him, well, the Torah was given with fire and we're studying Torah. So we're, we're, we are recapturing that. He's like, wow, is that what Torah is? I'm going to dedicate this son of mine to go study Torah as well. And uh, the those that tried to understand the story, uh, some have suggested, well, this father, he was like, um, he was directing his son, perhaps for the, uh, for not, for, you know, for, for the improper reasons. He wanted his son to have that same abilities, the same superpowers as the great rabbis. It wasn't a pursuit of Torah study for the proper reason. And maybe that's what led him astray. Or perhaps he was a overbearing father, you know, one of those fathers who is so committed that his child achieves greatness that maybe he messed up on the uh, on his pedagogical responsibilities and the kid eventually snapped. But regardless, we do see an instance where this actually plays out in the real world, where people who study Torah with such commitment that the Torah was not bland or stale or old. Rather, it was exciting, it was new, it was as if it was given to them at Sinai. So that's perhaps what Rashi means and what the Talmud means where we are committed or we ought to be committed, we ought to have the same experience and the same joy in doing mitzvos as the day was given. What it means is be so committed and magically that will result in excitement. But of course, this seems to be counterintuitive. Doing something repeatedly, again and again, we think ought to make it less exciting. We imagine that with regularity, the sense of novelty wanes. It doesn't increase, it's diminished. So what does it mean that when someone is entirely committed and does it on an ongoing basis, then their excitement is going to go up. We, should, we imagine that it would go down. So that's a question. We'll see. Again, we'll answer uh, all the questions in a little bit. Now, what's surprising is that the Talmud also addresses our original question. How do we maintain excitement with regards to mar- uh, marital intimacy? And that is addressed in the Talmud in Nida on page 31b. And the Talmud reads as follows, Rabbi Meir Omer, Rabbi Meir says, why does the Torah say that Anida, a woman during her period, is Timea Leshiva? Why does, why does she have to separate from her husband according to Torah law for a minimum of seven days? Mipnei, the reason why, Sherodilba, He's used to her. 
The husband and the wife are used to each other. Vikatspa, and he'll become disgusted by her. Amra Torah, therefore the Torah says, Let her be separated for seven days. Kidei shetehe chaviva albala kishas knisasa lechopa. In order that she should be as beloved unto her husband as the time that she entered the wedding canopy. Again, very interesting. We're pursuing the same goal. Both with our Torah study, we're trying to recapture the initial moment where the excitement was at its peak at Sinai. And also with marriage and with marital intimacy, we're trying to recapture the time where the excitement was at its greatest, at the initial union of husband and wife, at the wedding canopy. And what's really striking uh, is that we're actually told in several sources that Sinai was equivalent to a wedding canopy, for example, in the book of Exodus, on, in chapter 31, and the Almighty gave Moshe, when he completed talking to him on Mount Sinai, two luchos ha'edus, two tablets of testimony made out of stone written with the finger of God. Of course, those the, the, the tablets. But Rashi says, what does it mean, kechaloso? The word kechaloso uh, is written not the way you would expect. Says Rashi, this has something to do with the word kala. Kala means a bride. The Torah was given to him like a bride is given to a groom. Again, we see a description of Sinai as a formation, as a union of the Jewish people and Torah, the husband and wife, so to speak. And there's many other sources that compare a, the relationship that we have with Torah is the relationship that a man has with his wife. For example, the Midrash in the in Parsha's Truma, when the Jewish people are told to build a tabernacle, and they'll build me a tabernacle, and I will dwell amongst them. What does this mean that God will dwell amongst us? Says the Midrash. After Sinai, the Jewish people had Torah. After the Jewish people get Torah, the Almighty says, I need to be close to them. How so? So the Midrash gives us a parable of a king who had a lone daughter that he loved really much. And she, as she gets older, they found a suitable spouse, a prince from a foreign land, and they, there's a marriage. And after all the festivities uh, are over, the new husband, the new prince, wants to take his bride, the princess, back to his home. And the king, he tells the, his new son-in-law, the prince, I have a problem. I have a dilemma. I cannot depart from my daughter, your wife, and therefore I cannot imagine her going away and leaving me, on one hand. On the other hand, I can't tell you, you're the rightful husband of my daughter, I can't tell you not to take her. So let me tell you what the solution is going to be. Wherever you go, in your castle, in your palace, make a guest room, make a guest suite so I could be with you. You'll still have her, but she won't leave me. So too, says the Midrash. The Almighty tells the Jewish people, I gave you my daughter, so to speak. I gave you Torah. But I can't depart from Torah. I can't tell you not to take it. You should take it. But I cannot depart from it. And therefore, build for me a Mikdash. Build for me a tabernacle so I could always be with you. But again, we see that according to the Jewish sources, the relationship that the Jewish nation has with Torah is like a husband and wife. Additionally, there's many sources. Uh, the Talmud in, in, in Sanhedrin, page 59, uh, says, uh, The Torah was given to us by Moshe, or through Moshe, via Moshe. It is a, uh, a birthright of the Jewish people. It says the Talmud, don't read it as birthright. It's the betrothed of the Jewish people. And there's many other examples. You can see, for example, in Sanhedrin, page 99b, uh, where, again, it's compared the relationship of Jew with Torah as husband and wife. So we see very fascinating that there's these two unions, husband and wife, literal husband and wives, and husband and wife of Torah, Jew and Torah. And the Talmud is addressing both of these unions, and it asks the same question. 
How does the relationship husband and wife, how does that stay fresh? And how does the relationship of Jew and Torah, how does that stay fresh? And it gives us exactly opposite answers. It says Torah, you have to study every day of your your life. You have to have commitment, ongoing, never stop. And that's how you keep the relationship fresh. Whereas husband and wife, if you have every day of your life together, you're going to get disgusted with each other. You're going to get revulsion one from another. You're going to repel each other. Therefore, separation is the way to maintain newness. So it's incredibly striking to me that in two areas which are compared as being similar in the Torah, and in both we're asked the same question how to maintain novelty in, 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 in both of them, yet we give it exactly polar opposite answers. We say consistency and indulgence in marital intimacy leads to boredom and revulsion, and therefore separation is, is the way to keep things new. Whereas consistency in spiritual matters such as Torah, well, that leads to pleasure and newness. And thus, that is the solution, not the uh, problem, not the cause of the devolvement, but the cause of the solution to maintain newness. So, of course, these seem to be at odds with each other. How can they be reconciled? So I want to suggest an approach to answer all these questions. And I want to, let's begin this way. We quoted a verse, it's really a refrain that repeats itself again and again, uh, in Ecclesiastes. Ein kol chadash tachat hashamesh. There is nothing new under the sun. What if I asked you, what about over the sun? What about above the sun? If there's nothing new beneath the sun... But perhaps above the sun, there is new. There is novelty. Now, there are many sources that talk about Olam Haba, the spiritual world, or even the spiritual plane of existence, and compare it to the sun or even greater than the sun. I'll give you an example. For example, the Talmud in Brachos on page 34 says that all the prophets could... F- foresee the times of Mashiach, but Olam Abba, ayin lo rasa, and I cannot see it. One example. Another example, the Talmud in Baba Basra, page 75. Pinei Moshe, the face of Moshe, Moshe, the epitome of spiritual greatness, Pinei Chama, was like the face of the sun. Uh, the Talmud in Brachos, page 57, three things are me'ain Olam Haba, are like Olam Abba, and one of those three, th- three things is the sun. And uh, in the Talmud in Sanhedrin, it says that the light of the sun will diminish. In contrast, the light of Tzadikim, because the light of Tzadikim will be even greater. And of course, a uh, very famous Rashi in the beginning of Genesis, it talks about the uh, light. God created light on day one, even though there's no sun to capture that light or to harness that light or to be the bearer of that light. It says Rashi, that's talking about a spiritual light that is awaiting Tzadikim and Olam Abba. So there's this idea of light of the sun being spiritual. Perhaps we could say that indeed, and if you actually read Ecclesiastes, you'll see that this is evident what the intention of the author is not that uh, there's nothing new at all, rather there's nothing new in the physical sense. He, What he is doing, he's dovetailing with the Ramban that we quoted, that In this world, in matters of physical pleasures, everything is old, everything is is rote, everything is habit, everything is monotonous. There's no way to get something new, to get novelty. But perhaps we could say, I think it's it's evident in in, in in, in his point, all the way at the end of the book, is that there is a whole vast bastion of novelty in the spiritual world. But how does someone access that plane of existence where all the novelty lies? I want to quote you a very famous teaching in the Talmud in Brachos on page, I think it's 61. The Talmud tells of the Hadrianic persecutions, the persecution of the Jewish people under the emperor Hadrian in the 130s of the common era. And it says that one of the 
edicts of Hadrian was that there can be no Torah study, certainly no public Torah study. And the great Rabbi Akiva, well into uh, his second century of living, he ignored the edict, and he would gather students and teach Torah. And someone came over to Rabbi Akiva and says, well, how are you doing this? You know what the Romans will do to you? They'll torture you and kill you in a horrific way. What's wrong with you? Why are you teaching Torah publicly? You're going to get killed for it. And Rabbi Akiva responds by giving him a parable. He tells him, there was once a fox who was walking at the edge of, of the water, of a pond or a river. And he sees in the river, there is a fish that's darting as if he's evading something. So the fox asks the fish, what are you scared of? Why are you hiding? Why are you darting and diving uh, away from something? And the fish responds, well, there's fishermen here. And the fishermen, they have these nets that are cast about. And whoever gets caught in the nest, in, the, in, 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 the, in their nets, is lunch. I don't want to be eaten. And they're from hiding from the nets. So the fox responds to the fish, I have a solution. Why don't you come out with me, come onto land, and I looked far and near, there's no nets anywhere. The fishermen only put their nets in the water. You'll be safe on dry land with me. So the fish responds, are you what they call the wisest of all animals? Are you the cleverest, that's the fox, the cleverest of all animals? You're silly. Why? If in the place where I can have life, I'm a fish. I I can only breathe in the water. So if in the place where I have life, there is danger of death, in the place where I have death, certainly there is death. What Robert Hiva is telling this individual is that for me, the Torah is kihem chayin, the Torah is life. So if my life is in peril, if my life is threatened, if my life is endangered in the water, in Torah, and you want to suggest to pull me out of the water, to pull me out of life, well, how much more in danger would I be outside of the water, outside of Torah? What this is showing us is that Rabbi Kiva is telling us that for him, Torah is literally like oxygen. He needs it for life. What this means is that for him, he's not living in our world beneath the sun. He's not living in a physical world. He's living in a spiritual world. He's living above the sun. He cannot part with his Torah because he needs it for life. He is physiologically oriented in a way that he needs spiritual to live and not necessarily physical. What this means is that it's possible for someone to change in what area they're living in. They could live for physical pleasures. They could live below the sun, and thus all their needs are the needs of their body. And then there we're told there's nothing new. There's nothing new beneath the sun. If someone says, well, I want to imbibe in it, Well, the law is, the novelty principle states that by continually deepening your relationship with the things that are under the sun, then ironically, you'll get further and further away from novelty because novelty is only above the sun. So the deeper someone falls into the spirals of depravity of this world and making this world as an end unto its own, The further someone goes down that path, ironically, the less novelty they have in their life because the further they are walking away from where the novelty resides, which is above the sun. And that's what the Ramban is telling us. The Ramban is telling us that someone who lives their life and their oxygen, so to speak, is only the physical oxygen. All they're living for is this world and this world's pleasure. It's as an ends and not as a means. What someone like that they're going further away from where the venue of novelty lies above the sun in the spiritual world. This world, by definition, is a world of monotony, 
where the novelty is guaranteed to wane and you're going to cause a deeper need for new novelty, which you think you'd get by going further away, ironically, from where the novelty actually resides. And therefore, when someone's, once someone capitulates a little bit, they're actually going falling deeper and deeper away and further and further away from living uh, in, a, in, in a way that's new. When someone lives above the sun, so to speak, they live that their ultimate objective, his or her ultimate objective, is the spiritual world, is the world of their soul. Well, that actually changes what, what they need. Their oxygen, so to speak, is Torah. That's what they need for life, because that's what life is like on that plane. And by doing that, what can they eschew? What can they say no to? Well, this world's pleasures. How do we determine whether someone is living in this world beneath the, the sun or next world, the spiritual world above the sun, by finding out what their oxygen is, what they're able to abstain from? If someone is able to abstain from physical pleasures, obviously he's detached from the world of physical pleasures. That's not his oxygen. It's something that's there only to supplement and assist his true pursuit, which is above the sun, and therefore they have the power of renewal. Let's go back to the Talmud in Brachos 63b. How does someone have newness in their spiritual world? Study Torah every day. That doesn't refer to someone who forces themselves to study, who has to slog through it. What this is actually referring to is someone who's converted himself into a person who exists on a different plane, a person who lives for the spiritual and uses the physical world only as an aid. That person actually changes what they, how they live. It's, it's their soul who is their identity and their body is just there. So what they need to feed is their spiritual oxygen. They need Torah. They study Torah every day, not because... That's just what they choose to do. It's what gives them life. That's what they need to do. They're like Rabbi Akiva, who compares the Torah to oxygen. Such a life, when someone is so committed to the spiritual world, well, then, of course, then they're living above the sun. That's where the novelty reigns. And thus continues the Talmud. What happens when someone misses a day of Shema? So to us, we say, well, he he made most of the days, right? He almost never misses. How can we blame him? That is an attitude of a below-the-sun perspective. Such an attitude, what does it mean? If we're okay with someone missing a day of Shema, what does that show? Is that we don't equate mitzvos with vital necessities for life. And therefore, it's okay if you miss a day. Does anyone say it's okay if you miss a day of breathing? Of course not. If we had the attitude of Rabbi Akiva or Rabbi Eliezer or Rabbi Hoshua, the people who actually lived in that world, to them it would be unthinkable to miss a day of Shema, just as it would be unthinkable for us to miss a day of eating or drinking or oxygen. It's not possible for us. That's what we need to live. If someone who is living in that world, the world of novelty, what they need to live is mitzvos. Thus, when someone misses a single day of Shema, well, that actually reveals, how could he miss a day? You just forgot. If you just forgot, do you forever, ever forget to just eat? Of course not. You ever forget to breathe? Of course not. That's what you need to live. Once someone misses a single day of Shema, that actually reveals that all the preceding days of Shema that he said were not because he was living in that high world, that world where things are new as if they were given at Sinai. Rather, he was living in this world and happened to do a mitzvah. And thus, as if he never said Shema on that level with that degrees in his whole life. Thus, in conclusion, both Talmudic solutions to how, of how to solve the novelty dilemma are actually, in effect, saying the same thing. When someone is able to depart from his spouse and depart from physical pleasure for a given time, that actually demonstrates that what they are connected to what they're living for is the spiritual world. Because if they were living for the physical world, well, how could they walk away from it? 
That's what they need for life. Thus, when someone is not able to connect from the spiritual world, but is able to disconnect, I'm sorry, when someone is not able, unable to disconnect from the spiritual world, but is able to disconnect from the physical world, that demonstrates that they're actually living above the sun, and thus there's newness in every area of their life. Because every part, everything's a mitzvah, even the physical pleasures can be a mitzvah in the proper context when done to assist the spiritual goal. Thus, we have a cohesive solution to our question. Indeed, in this world, if you are resigned to only live for this world and this world's pleasures, Ein kol chadash tachas It's a law, it's a fixed law that there's no novelty. You may have a fleeting sense of novelty that will only deepen the desire, only increase the hunger for future novelty. Whereas in the spiritual world, in the world of mitzvos, it has that innate power. It comes from a different world. The mitzvos are the mitzvos of God. It's God's mitzvos. It's God's Torah. It comes from the other world, from the world above the sun. And that world innately has novelty and newness to it. When someone does mitzvos every day, they're training themselves to start living for the other world. And by doing that, they're able to tap into a sense of newness, of novelty in every area of their life because all areas of their life are united because they're all in pursuit of the ultimate goal. And thus, even the physical things are mitzvos, and even they benefit from the sense of novelty uh, present in that world. I thank you all for listening. Um, if you want to email me, please do so, rabbiwalby at gmail.com. Of course, subscribe, share the podcasts with your friends. I would love also as well if you would consider making a donation to continue the outreach and education efforts of our organization, Torch, the Torah Outreach Resource Center of Houston, uh, especially because we are are victims of this recent flood and our center, our Torch Center, was absolutely devastated. Uh, We have a long and expensive rebuild ahead of us. So please consider, I have the link in the description of every podcast. Uh, Go to rebuildtorch.com or go to torchweb.org and help support us. I thank you all and have a great day.